Welcome to the Legal Business Podcast from LK Shields, where we discuss the commercial application of the law and how you can shore up your business for success. In this edition, insolvency and litigation partner Jill Callanan discusses directors' duties and liabilities during the COVID-19 crisis, as well as options available to directors to ensure a company's survival. Hello, everybody. Today, I'm going to discuss two areas which I've seen come across my desk on a number of occasions over the past few months since the COVID-19 crisis began. First of all, I'm going to look at the duties and liabilities of the directors and officers of companies in the context of COVID-19. I'm then going to look at various restructuring options which are available to companies to ensure their survival. So turning firstly to the duties of directors, since this crisis began, we've seen concerns being raised by directors and many bodies in Ireland representing directors in relation to potential liability that could be imposed on them if they cause their businesses to continue to trade where there is a risk of insolvency in these unpredictable times. I'm going to look at these potential liabilities on directors. And then secondly, if it becomes clear that the business is insolvent or at a risk of becoming insolvent, there are options available to directors to save the company and ensure its survival. I'm also going to be looking at these options. So turning firstly to the duties and liabilities of directors and senior managers. First of all, I'm going to look at the potential actions which can be taken against directors. Firstly, we have reckless trading. To make a finding of reckless trading against the director, which is the finding that ultimately makes the director personally liable for the debts of the company, the court must determine that he or she knew or ought to have known his or her actions or those of the company will cause loss to creditors. In a case where reckless trading is alleged, a finding that an officer acted honestly and responsibly in relation to the conduct of the affairs of a company may relieve the officer of personal liability. The courts have set the reckless trading hurdle reasonably high and the Irish judiciary have some appreciation for entrepreneurial risk. Another action which can be taken against directors is an action of fraudulent trading. And this is where the directors may be made personally liable for the liabilities of an insolvent company where he or she knowingly carries on the business with an intent to fraud creditors. And finally, another another action that can be taken is is the action of a restriction. And this is where the Director of Corporate Enforcement directs that restriction proceedings be issued against the director by a liquidator unless it is satisfied that the director acted honestly and responsibly in relation to the affairs of the company. So I now want to turn to the various steps that that should be it was followed to ensure directors are properly fulfilling their duties. Where there's a clear risk of insolvency, the directors owe a duty to the company's creditors not to conduct business in such a way as to prejudice their interests. To manage this and to ensure the directors are properly fulfilling their duties where they continue trading while in the zone of insolvency, the board should ensure that the following occurs. Firstly, it should closely investigate the financial position and the future prospects for the company. It should continuously monitor the company's financial position. It should support the view that the company can continue to trade through its financial difficulties with documentary evidence. It should obtain legal advice on the implications of any proposed material action, be that disposals or or group restructuring. It should hold frequent board meetings, prepare regular management accounts. It should ensure that the company's books and records are current and accurate. And it should take material decisions only after considering the impact on creditors. I now want to look at directors' duties in the context of COVID-19. And as I mentioned earlier, in the present climate, many directors are becoming increasingly concerned of the risks of personal liability being imposed on them if they cause their insolvent business to continue to trade with the anticipation that it will trade itself out of difficulty once the current COVID-19 crisis lifts. The Office of the Director of Corporate Enforcement has in the last number of weeks issued a very helpful statement in relation to its view on restriction proceedings against directors. In summary, this statement provides that the ODCE will have regard to the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic in its consideration of liquidated reports regarding the conduct of directors. 
It will in particular consider such things as the director's processes for monitoring the company's financial position, whether the, the director sought professional advice, the basis upon which the company directors formed the view that the company would be able to trade after these difficulties, the length of time that trading continued after the company was insolvent, the extent to which the company's financial position began to deteriorate and the steps taken to reduce costs. Importantly, the statement provides that in circumstances where the director's decisions were made on the basis of verifiable evidence, made in good faith, and the directors otherwise acted honestly and responsibly, it will be unlikely that the director of corporate enforcement would consider bringing restriction proceedings against the directors. This statement will no doubt provide some comfort to directors of insolvent companies in the current COVID-19 crisis. Separately, there have also been many calls by directors for the government to adopt a similar approach to that recently introduced by the UK and Australian governments to temporarily suspend corporate insolvency laws such as reckless trading. Such a suspension would provide a level of comfort to directors of companies that are otherwise viable, but in financial difficulty due to COVID-19. It does remain to be seen whether the Irish government will take steps to suspend or, or, or even amend the current legislation regarding reckless trading or restriction proceedings. However, even if no amendments are made, made to the current legislation, provided the company was insolvent at the start of the pandemic and the directors acted responsibly, for example, by adopting the measures which I, which I listed earlier, in my view, it would be unlikely that a court would make a finding of reckless trading against the director. I now want to turn to the second part of my podcast, which is the restructuring options for companies, whether they're insolvent or not. Some businesses may be well advised to seek to renegotiate arrangements with creditors, while others may require formal core protection from creditors to assist them while the arrangements of the creditors are being put in place. On the other hand, a company or group of companies might consider a corporate restructuring as a mechanism to ensure business continuity or to position the company as an attractive candidate for investments or funding, or indeed as a target for an acquisition. There are a number of such avenues available to businesses, which I'm just going to address below. So the first option is the contractual restructuring of debts. And this is the contractual option whereby the company and its creditors reach agreement in relation to the amendment of payment terms or restructuring of a debt. There is no need for court approval, but it obviously requires the agreement of both sides. The second option is the examinership option, and this is the full-scale corporate rescue device that requires court oversight at every stage. A court application is firstly required to appoint the examiner, and the court will only approve the appointment of an examiner if it is satisfied of a number of matters, These include that the company will be able to fund itself during the period of examinership and that a party has expressed an interest in investing in the company. Once the examiner is appointed, he will seek to secure an investor and provided he succeeds, he then proceeds to format the scheme for arrangement. Once the creditors have voted on the scheme, it is then put before the court for approval. In the context of COVID-19, it has been recognised that as matters currently stand, a successful examinership may be difficult to achieve in light of the fact that it may be hard to attract an investor during this tight window of the 100-day examinership period. Another restructuring option is the scheme of arrangement, and this has often been a neglected procedure to assist companies to restructure. However, In the context of COVID-19, in my view, it could prove to become a very popular option for companies faced with sudden cash flow issues. In theory, a scheme can be an arrangement about anything that the company and its members and creditors can properly agree on amongst themselves. It can be implemented by a company, whether solvent or insolvent. And therefore, the scheme regime offers management a real opportunity to take restructuring action when financial or operational challenges emerge. The scheme is primarily a two-stage process. Stage one involves the construction of a proposal for a scheme and the approval of a scheme by the company's members or creditors. And stage two then involves an application to the High Court for final review and sanction of the scheme. In the context of restructuring of company debts, the advantages of a scheme of arrangement over examinership is that it requires less court applications and therefore is far less costly than an examinership. 
It encourages discussion amongst the creditors and ultimate court approval, ensuring that the new arrangement is enforced on all creditors, even dissenting ones. And now turning to the to restructuring of company or group of companies. In the current difficult environment, a company or group of companies might consider undertaking a corporate restructuring as a mechanism to ensure survival beyond COVID-19. There are certain restructurings which are, which are provided for in the 2014 Act, and these include a merger by absorption where the assets and liabilities of the wholly owned subsidiary are transferred to its parent company and the subsidiaries then dissolve. Another example is whereby a division could be utilised to split off an unprofitable business line to better protect the survival and more profitable and stable part of the company's business. It should be borne in mind, however, that the merging division regime provided for in the 2014 Act are primarily available to solvent companies only. I hope this, um, this talk has been helpful to you all. Thank you very much. Thank you for tuning in to this edition of the Legal Business Podcast from LK Shields. You can find previous editions on a variety of topics on iTunes or Spotify. For more information or to subscribe, visit www.lkshields.ie.